Okay, welcome everyone to our World Environment Week Conversations. This is day two and I have another awesome human to interview today. I have Mark Keenan from Zoos Victoria. Welcome, Mark. Thank you Thanks for joining for us Great today. To ah, no, we're just super excited. So um, just wanted to have a bit of a chat about what you do basically. So what is your job title? So my job is the Marine Response Unit Coordinator and essentially I um, help coordinate uh, marine rescue across the state of Victoria for marine wildlife in distress. And does that, so does that cover a range of different animals? It does, it does. So when we initially were pulled together as a group, so we've been uh, working for Melbourne Zoo since 2013 and initially we were set up to help seals, um, but we also work closely with government to help cetaceans, so dolphins and whales, um, but also turtles, you know, we have sharks and rays, we have a bunch of different things that we assist with, so uh, yeah, but primarily, our primary focus is seals. Okay, and is that because they're more likely to be reported as entangled? It's a, it's a tricky one, Mandy. Um, we're very lucky in, in, in Victoria that we have incredible wildlife carers who can assist wildlife of all different descriptions. But seals are a, a little bit of a black hole. Um, seals are, are big, very intelligent animals and actually they're protected by government. So wildlife carers can't assist seals on beaches, which makes sense, you know, a yep. wildlife carer can't take a seal home and put it in there. So seals were this, um, this little black hole where you know government really didn't have capacity to help them wildlife carers couldn't help them so zoos victoria plays a really important role because we have the expertise we have the resources to take animals back and rehab them we have the skills in vets and and, and staff that work with seals at the zoo so um, we filled this hole wow that's pretty amazing i mean you know how how did you end up with a job like this uh, so yeah, look, I mean, I've been a zookeeper for 14 years now, so I've worked with elephants and orangutans and all these animals, but my passion has always been uh, the coast. I, I grew up on the Mornington Peninsula, I surfed and dived and snorkeled my whole childhood. Um, and, and then, you know, the opportunity came up to work with, you know, our, our local marine wildlife at the zoo and I took it. And, and over the years I built skills and, and when the opportunity came, um, to do this MRU role, I, I jumped at it. I, I, yeah, it's perfect for me. Yeah, right up your street, basically. Yeah. So, what does your day to day job look like? And I know that's probably a really difficult question. People have asked me that, and I'm like, well, uh, I don't have a typical day. I'm sure you don't, but you know, sort of, if you if you get a call, say, what would your day look like? Yeah. So. And as you said, it, it, every single day is different, which is actually part of the reason that, that I enjoy the job so much because uh, there's nothing, you know, more satisfying than coming to, to work. And, and for me, working in a, in a, in a space of chaos, really. Um, so look, for instance, um, I'll give you an example of the last day I worked and, and possibly I go back to work on Thursday and, and it's going to be very much like that. So, you know, we might get a call regarding a seal and, and say it's an entangled seal, which is probably, you know, our highest priority and it's also some of the more challenging work we do. But we've had a, a seal spotted very recently at Pope's Eye, which is actually, um, whether, whether the students know, is, is actually a... Um, a marine habitat in Port Phillip Bay. It's actually a, a, a park, a marine park. Um, and there's a big seal on there that has a, a horrible, deeply embedded entanglement. Now this is a hundred kilo seal. Um, and then my job is to go, okay, we need to A, look at the safety of it and think about how we might go of rescuing a big seal on, on, a, on an unusual structure. This is a big grouping of rocks. So it's big rocks that you'd have to clamber over to help the seal. I have to try and organise a boat, I have to look at weather windows and then organise enough staff at the zoo, including a veterinarian, to come along and assist with this rescue and plan it out and then, you know, and, um, and then pull the trigger and hopefully assist this animal in the safest possible way. And, of course, the zoo is at one end of Port Phillip Bay and Pope's Eye is right down the other end, so that alone is uh, a bit of a logistical challenge for you. 
Yeah, yeah. Look, we so as I said earlier, this role is sort of we try and coordinate rescues across the state of Victoria, and we sometimes we're coordinating other agency or people to assist us in do, doing this work, and sometimes it's indeed ourselves. And and obviously, when it is ourselves, that time factor is a really important thing. You know, seals and any animal, to be honest with you, even if they are sick, they don't they're not likely to stick around. You know, they're still very much concerned with their own welfare and will run away. So when we do have these things, yeah, sometimes the time it takes for us to get from point A to point B, you know, and, and there's been plenty of times where we've gotten the car facilitated this big rescue and we've got to the destination four hours later for them to say, oh, well, actually the seal just got into the water five minutes ago and that's it swimming around over there. And there's nothing more upsetting about that, but that's the reality of the work. So they're all things that we have to factor in. We try and be as quick as we can and we try and, you know, give ourselves the best possible chance to, to, to have a good outcome. But the reality is, is dealing with wildlife, dealing with animals, it's always a famous quote, you know, it's a, it's a really tricky space because you're never sure what an animal's going to do. Absolutely. And I, I know that you also rely on some very experienced local people to give you some more detailed information because people can mistake um, sometimes think that seals uh, or other animals are in distress and actually they're perfectly fine and, and people are being very well meaning but you can't afford to sort of come out when it's not necessary so um, and that kind of answers one Absolutely. of the questions I was going to ask about you know what are the more challenging aspects of your job so uh, apart from I think most people would probably think just wrestling the seal is the biggest challenge but it's all the other factors that go together isn't it and I think you've said a, you've said a really pertinent point there, Mandy, is, is that we, we're only as effective as the information we have. So when people come across animals that they don't really have any experience with, and it tends to be a really high stress situation, no one wants to see an animal suffering or in pain, but it's their interpretation of that. So it's really important that we have good information. And so in, indeed we do, we use lots of different stakeholders around the, uh, around the coast of Australia. Sometimes it is members of public and sometimes we just ask a member of public as many questions as we can to try and draw that information out. Sometimes we use, you know, government agency like Parks Victoria or Fisheries and indeed we use organisations like DRI. We've had situations where we've had DRI out of Chinaman's Hat and said, hey, you know, what's this animal? What does it look like? Because we rely on professional opinions and, we, and we've established a network of people that we trust implicitly to do this sort of stuff because we, we can't be everywhere at once. Oh, absolutely. And um, I feel very lucky and privileged to now be part of that um, network. And I learned the hard way a very long time ago uh, when to interfere and when not to. I'm from the UK and we found a seal at one of the beaches. And it just so happened that there was actually uh, an aquarium that did have sort of, you know, knowledge at the other end of the beach. So I dutifully ran round. It took me about 20 minutes. And when I got there, they said, yeah, it's fine. It's asleep. Yeah. Oh, okay. And they said, thanks for telling us, but yeah, don't worry about it. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll pay more attention in the future. <laughs> and, this is, and this is a really interesting thing as well, is that, um, so with seabirds, you know, almost 90% of seabird cases we get, we intervene with. If you can come across a bird that is in trouble and, and people can get close to, you can guarantee that that bird needs to come into care. Yep. Seal... Uh, one of the strongest, toughest, pig-headed, stoic animals you could ever imagine. And we probably only intervene about one of five seal cases. And that is because they're so resilient and they heal. And so sometimes we have to weigh up the value of bringing them in for care and rehab versus leaving them be and just giving them time and protection to repair themselves. Um, and so that's the real challenge with seals is, you know, it's, a, it's a, an enormous thing to bring a seal into, into for a, a rehab because they are very, very smart animals and they learn bad behaviours really quickly and they don't know what's going on. So it's a really stressful thing for you to go and grab a steel out of the environment and bring it back to the zoo and try and make it eat fish and try and get it to sit still because it's got a, an IV line in it and stitches in it and all those things. So, um, so there's some real challenges there also with ethics and resources and stuff like that too. Yeah. Okay. And and I did have a question about you know how easy it is it is it to rehabilitate a seal, but clearly it's it's a very tricky thing. And and yeah, I understand those differences. So I guess one of the things that really we need people to do is to stop littering in the first place. Uh, the things that seals get entangled in, you know, the fishing line, um, 
I've even seen, you know, frisbees around seals, and that would be a real help for your unit to not have to, you know, deal with some of these issues. Yeah, we get asked all the time, you know, what entangles seals, and, and the reality is, is we and we can't ignore it, is that fishing line and, and fishing materials tend to be the most the thing that most entangles seals. But literally anything that is incapable, capable of encircling an animal is a potential entanglement. Um, you know, we've seen hat bands. Um, so hats, you know, if a hat blows off someone's head and into the water body, uh, interestingly, it tends to be the material that makes up the top of the hat that breaks down. But you're always left with a strong band. If you think about the strongest part of the hat, it's the bit that goes around your head. Sure. And we've had seals caught up in those. Um, we've seen face masks, snorkeling masks, anything, literally. <laughs> And, you know, and beyond seals, and we talk about seals a lot, but beyond seals, literally anything. Like, I mean, I, and I said this, I quoted this the other day, literally anything that is man-made that shouldn't be in the environment should be considered a threat to animals and should be taken out. We, um, we rescued, excuse me, a beautiful Australian, Australasian data, which is a, a beautiful sort of um, river-dwelling sort of uh, bird, um, like a cormorant, a little yeah. bit like a and, yep. and this bird had a baby sock that it had obviously investigated and, and, and put its beak through, but they have a very serrated beak and this sock had been stuck on this bird's beak for two weeks and the bird couldn't open its mouth and literally couldn't feed for a period of two weeks and we were lucky to be able to catch it eventually. But, you know, is there anything less scary than a baby sock? But for an animal that, you know, that doesn't know what a baby sock, it could be fatal. So it's, it's yeah, um, we, can't, we can't say that enough really that... You know, yeah. if you had the opportunity to pick up rubbish, irrespective of what it is, we should do it. We should all do it. Absolutely. That, that's a really fascinating story. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, people lose all the time and like hats, like you were saying, off boats and things. So, so we can all really make a difference and, and help your job. And I, and I think it would be fair to say that even if, you know, we removed all of this, there would still be uh, the need for, uh, people like yourself in this role because you know animals need help for various reasons but it would certainly make your job less challenging I guess. Absolutely you know people the role people can play a picking up rubbish that's yeah but be vigilant you know we're all we're all you know we all live on this earth together we all live in this beautiful place called Victoria and we're very very lucky in Victoria to have the environment we have but you know, we all have to be responsible bay users and beach users. So when we're down the beach, if we see wildlife, you know, if it is in distress, we make a call. But if it's not in distress and just resting, then it's really important that we give these animals the space. You know, we have lots of beautiful nesting shorebirds and seabirds. You know, these animals need to be left alone and their, you know, their nests and eggs protected. We also, we always have um, lots of issues with responsible dog ownership and, you know, dogs being off leash on leashed areas and dogs attacking seals or other birds on beaches. So, you know, we all have a big part to play in this and it's not just about litter, it's about our, our behaviour. Absolutely. And I actually saw something uh, recently that adds to this and that's the sort of rise of digital photography and how um, obviously we've got some amazing people taking photographs, but it's how close do you get to some of these animals and really if you're doing the right thing, it's about staying back respectful distances so that you still get the shot that you want to show the world, but actually you're not affecting that animal. They're not really aware of your presence. And that's a tricky balance um, these days. And, and not everybody's managing to keep that balance, I think. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that like to take selfies and things like that, but I'm a passionate diver and I'm a passionate underwater photographer. And I've certainly seen that firsthand as well with some people willing to almost manipulate animals to get the right photo. And then I think they've really lost, you know, the reason for being there. They want to show nature and show how beautiful nature is. And if you're manipulating nature, then, you know, you're doing more damage than good, aren't you? I think so. Yeah. Because, you know, we want them to, you know, we're trying to celebrate their behavior, but then we're actually changing their behavior by ours. And, uh, and, and with the development of technology now, there's some incredible, you know, high powered zooms that people don't have to get close to still take the shot. That Absolutely. And, you know, um, I think the best nature photography is always when you're actually able to capture animals behaving in their natural manner. Um, and yeah, if once you've got a good eye for that, you can actually see what's, you know, an, an animal behaving naturally and an animal that's not behaving naturally. So yeah, a, a photo of a wild, an animal in the wild is always 10 times better than, for, than a manipulated photo or a photo of someone getting too close. 
I might just quickly share my screen because I've got a photo of one of the places that sometimes you get called out to and that's Chinaman's Hat. Um, so, and for those people, so a, a lot of my ambassadors uh, either, uh, you know, I do take them out here on one of the tour operator boats. Uh, unfortunately, this year we had to cancel a few of the trips. So we're looking to do them at the end of the year, um, all things um, being equal with the restrictions. But this is Chinaman's Hat out in the middle and, and there's a lot of seals out here. So, you know, is this, and as you mentioned Pope's Eye, is this is one of the other places that you would um, attend because there's obviously quite a, a collection of seals out here on a, a fairly regular basis. This is the place we probably head to most entanglements within Port Phillip Bay. Um, this so Chinaman's Hat for all those if you, if you don't know and I appreciate some of you have been there But this is the only man-made haul out structure. So seals breed offshore at places like uh, at Seal Rocks at Phillip Island um, My and photo this is, behind me <laughs> yeah, 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 perfect. So this is not so Chinaman's Hat isn't a breeding colony But it's a haul out. So this is a place for the animals to rest when they're, they're in between their fishing sort of um, missions um, and we get up, you know, upwards of 60 seals on there on any given day. And most of these animals are in and out of Port Phillip Bay. They don't actually live there as residents. Most of them are sort of transient animals that are moving between seal rocks and Port Phillip Bay. But it's a, such a special place. And we, we see lots of entangled animals there because that's, you know, where, where people come in contact with seals en masse. But, you know, um, Rebecca McIntosh and, and the biologists at Phillip Island see tons of entangled seals on, on seal rocks, as you can imagine. So this is a little snapshot in Port Phillip Bay, a, a smaller population, but we, we get a lot of entanglement out there. Yeah, and it's actually quite an important haul out because I learned recently that uh, Australian fur seals don't haul out on sand. They, they need rocky structures or, or platforms like this. So it's actually a, a good spot for them to be. Um, Mark, I'll ask you one final question before we wrap up. I'm so grateful for your time. Obviously, can't avoid what's been going on for the last nine or ten weeks. How has um, coronavirus uh, affected your ability, you know, to do your job, or the, you know, sort of, has it increased um, calls because more people are out, sort of, you know, not working and, and seeing animals in stress, or has it gone down? Yeah, it's it's been incredibly interesting, Mandy. So. Um, seal calls, we've probably had a reduction in seal calls and that's because obviously without people boating and fishing and, and, and going to places like Chinaman's Hat, we've, we've had less eyes out on the, on the bay areas and, on, and, and, and the ocean areas. But um, we've had a massive, massive surge in numbers of animals in sort of coastal areas. So because people, I think, you know, they haven't been able to go out nearly as much as they look to. So when they do go out there, they're super hyper vigilant. They see everything and report everything. Um, yeah. And, um, and you know, everyone's walking and stuff. So we've had tons and tons of bird calls and coastal bird calls. Yeah. Um, and dog, and we've, unfortunately, the, the really horrible side of it is we've had a, a massive spike of dog attacks as well. I think there's a lot more people walking their dogs, perhaps in areas where they're not used to walking their dogs. Um, and we've had seen lots of black swans and some seals and stuff attacked by dogs. So it's actually, you know, I was expecting it to go quiet and down and that I was going to get a little bit of break and a time to reset. But if, if anything, it's been busier. It's been busier. Okay. But has, have the restrictions made it harder for you to, you know, intervene oh. with social distancing and number of people and, you know, being around? Absolutely. You know, it's just made, um, we, you can imagine um, when we bring animals back to the zoo and we bring lots of animals back to the zoo for veterinary care, that's a massive part of what we do. Um, and, you know, when you're restraining an animal for veterinary care and you've got, you can't ha help but have people on top of each other. So, you know, at the zoo, we're very, very, you know, we're cleaning constantly. We're all in face masks. We're all gowned up almost constantly. And the same with rescues. If I take someone out and rescue, we have, we're lucky to have an ambulance, an ex-ambulance that, has an atmosphere separated front from back. And so we put someone in the front and we put someone in the back and keep them separate. And then when we get out in the field, we have our gloves and our masks on. So it's all very doable. It's just, you know, it's just a little bit awkward and, and we have to think through these things, but we haven't stopped. We haven't said no to anything. It has been a bit challenging with seal rescues. We, as I said, we've got a seal rescue that may happen even, even this week. Um, and it's, and it's, 
and it's working with organizations and, and some organizations aren't really comfortable with having too many people on a boat. So it's trying to find someone who's willing to work with us and work through some of the problems of social distancing on a boat. Um, but you know, we'll get there. Like we're pretty determined like that. <laughs> And that's, that's really awesome that you're still being able to do that. But I think, again, it's a timely reminder, isn't it, for all of us that every, every behaviour that we do differently to, you know, not impact um, our marine life or our, any of our wildlife, there's, there's knock-on effects that we haven't even thought about. So anything we can do is going to help people like yourself do your job more effectively and, and not put you in any sort of, you know, danger. I guess that's coming down yeah, to the point. Absolutely. But um, yeah, like, I mean, I, I love the fact that, you know, um, I've always thought that education is ultimately the answer to all of this because that the Marine Response Unit is, is really important, but it's very clunky. You know, we go around chasing after animals that are already impacted, that are already sick, um, you know, that have already been, yeah. So the reality is, is, even though we're good at what we do, our success rate is pretty poor because most of those animals, by the time you actually have the chance to intervene, are beyond help, you know, or, or you know, ultimately, and it's very sad, but they need to be euthanized from a welfare perspective because, you know, we can't, we can't make things better in some instances. So the most important thing is to stop these things happening in the first place. And that's the power of, of organisations like DRI and the ambassadors you're working with to go, you know, we can be better at this. We can avoid these things happening in the first place. And that's what we need to do. And if I'm put out of a job, you know, that's good because it means that we live in a much better place. Yeah. Uh, and I think most of us in this space would feel the same way. If we no longer were needed, then that's a win-win, <laughs> basically. So, we, live, we live in a better world, so yeah. Absolutely. If anyone has any concerns, uh, is there a number that they can call? Yeah, so the MRU number, let me, uh, get me get now I'm just thinking it off the top of my head. I know the mobile number really well, but there's actually a, um, a 1300 number. So it's 1300 245 678. And that's awesome and obviously you know anyone can now put that on their phone that's that's watching this because we will be putting it out on our facebook and sending it to the ambassadors mark thank you so much for giving up your time on what i know is a day off for you i really appreciate it um we all think you're a legend and the, and the work that you do and we're proud and privileged to know you and to be able to contribute a little bit um, both personally and through dri so thank you so much and um thank look you, forward to Thanks. Seeing you Pick in the field the sometime. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thanks, Mark. Okay.